we didn't get to see Scarlett, but now she's enjoying us so much she's gone to sleep. And um, the two boys are with their grandparents having a, a, a grandkids holiday with um, their grandparents in Texas, and we miss them. And Brother Sanders is probably getting tired of this now, but I told him we were only going to pay him half since Charlie and Levi aren't here. But we appreciate this family and fell in, in love with their children when they were here last. And we enjoy very much um, their fellowship and company. And looking forward to hearing from the word from them here in just a couple of moments. Jody, we celebrated your graduation last week without you. But it's good to see you here and congratulations. I think we've covered most, most of those. And I know Chloe has a birthday today, and it's just a special day all the way around. So we're glad that all of our families are here this, this morning. But let's just take the next hour or so, and let's let the Lord's Spirit speak to our hearts, His Word, and let's respond. Let's not just hear the Word and go home and say how good it was, but let's let it change our hearts and lives. Coming to the front and praying is not an acknowledgement of being a sinner, or being a bad person, or not knowing God. When you come to the front, all you're saying is, I want a little bit more. I want God's presence and guidance in my heart and life. And I would hope that describes everybody in this room. So today, when the preaching is finished, and you feel a compelling move in your spirit, respond to it, and let's let God touch all of us and guide us. Brother Sister Sanders, glad you're here. Brother Jonathan Sanders, make yourself at home. Man, would you give Jesus a great round of applause? Has he been good to you to help you to get to the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. What a beautiful congregation you have. And it is mirrored by the presence of the Holy Ghost that I feel here today. And I'm just so thankful uh, that our family is able to be back in Finley. And I wish I had my boys with me. They're on vacation uh, with my mom and dad, they have kind of a grandparents, grandkids vacation every year. And when they heard that we were coming over here to be with Brother and Sister Ellingsworth and with you, they uh, they wished that we could rearrange the schedule a little bit, but maybe we'll get to make that happen again sometime. But I'm happy to have my girls with me, and I'd like for my wife just to stand and say a word and leave a word of testimony this morning. Amen. You can find everything you need in the presence of the King. Amen. A generation ago, my great-grandmother sent three of her sons to Vietnam, and uh, only one of them returned home. And so it is on each Memorial Day that I like to just give honor to all of those who have laid down their life. And I'm so thankful for the opportunity to preach the gospel today because there have been those who went before us who were willing to sacrifice to give us the freedom and the liberty of worship that we have here today. And so I'm so very thankful for that this morning. I'm also thankful for those who have laid down their lives for the gospel. The word of the Lord says that there's no greater love than that a man would lay down his life for a friend. And so we're on Memorial Day and uh, leading up to Pentecost, and so I really just felt like I would... I asked the Lord if he would give me something fitting to preach today, and so I feel like the Lord has done that. So if you have your Bibles today, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 34, and as you are turning there, I just want you to know that I love Brother and Sister Ellingsworth, and you ought to, you ought to love them too. And these are great people, and uh, Brother Ellingsworth, I, I appreciate their spirit, 
And uh, my spirit just agrees with, with what I feel in B- Pastor and Sister Ellingsworth. And uh, I like their idea of how to live for God and how to have church and uh, how to grow a healthy church. Everything just feels right. This is a great church. Amen. How many believe you're in a great church? It's a great church. And uh, I give honor to all of the great saints of God who have been going and loving and living and giving. This is a church with a heart for missions. And so uh, from the rest of the church worldwide, I say thank you today for who you are. And uh, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 34 this morning, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. When he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. They crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And Sitting down, they watched him there and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand, another on the left. They that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. Another translation says it this way, he saved other people, but he could not save himself. So if you'll consider with me for a moment this morning that two thieves hung on the cross for the crime of taking, but I'm thankful that Jesus went to the cross for the cause of giving. And I'm so thankful that he laid down his life for us today. For just a few moments, I want to just talk to you about the difference between would not and could not. I wonder if you'll just pray for the preaching of the word. I wonder if you'll just pray, maybe lift up your voice, lift up your hands, and ask the Lord to help us to open up our hearts and our minds. Jesus, we love you. Lord, we're so thankful for your wonderful presence that we feel so strongly in this house today. I pray, God, that every word that is spoken, Lord, let it be ordered by the Holy Ghost. I pray that minds and that hearts would be open today. Help us, God, Lord, to receive your word with gladness and to respond in faith today. For when faith is mixed with the word, it will profit those which believe. And we thank you for it today. Would you give the Lord a great hand clap of thanksgiving today? Amen. What a mighty, mighty God he is. I would like to begin today by painting a picture for you. It is the picture of a clear Saturday morning decades ago before many of us were even alive just outside of Dayton, Ohio. It is a little after 9 a.m., several thousand people have gathered together to witness the brilliance of the Air National Guard's jet performance. I'm not sure if you've ever attended an air show, but when I was a kid, people would drive great distances to see the pilots and to see the air show and their performance. The team that morning was made up of well-trained pilots called the Minutemen. Many of these Minutemen were skilled, and many of them were battle-tested World War II veteran pilots. And this morning, they were flying their red saber jets. Against a clear blue Saturday sky, the team is pre-programmed. Their routine is meticulous in its precision. They have a designated flight path. They have the plan laid out, the Minutemen will take off and they will merge their planes together in close formation, guiding them closely and carefully. And at just the precise moment, there will be a few that will break off and do twists and turns and barrel rolls. And then they will come together in that same formation and they will do it again and again. 
as they are going about their routine, there is a little button on the throttle of each of those red saber jets. And as the pilot will hit that button on the throttle, there will be released from the back of that saber jet a puff or a stream of smoke if he holds the button down. And uh, it is released and the pilot will hit that button at the instruction of his commanding officer on the ground. And so the crowd on the ground erupts in applause as they watch the Minutemen as they will hit the buttons on the throttle of their saber jet and smoke will roll out. And with the smoke, they are painting a mural across that clear blue sky there at 9 in the morning in Dayton, Ohio, decades ago. Something happens that morning to one of the planes. It was that of Sabre pilot John Ferrier. Something has gone wrong with his plane. Johnny Ferrier is a skilled pilot. He has experienced in the air, but even experience and skill cannot overcome a badly damaged plane. These Minutemen were those that preceded what we know today as the Blue Angels. They were the elite. Many of them were war heroes skilled in the skies. Their routine was well practiced. Each pilot was well aware of his own flight plan and he was also aware of every move that his neighbor around him would make while they were in the air. Every twist and turn was plotted with exact precision. There were no moments of inspiration and all of it was planned until that Saturday morning in June one of the planes, that of Johnny Ferrier, unexpectedly broke formation. It might have been a wing, someone said. Technicians surmised that it could have been something that they called a hydraulic misfire. Regardless of the malfunction, Captain John Ferrier, as hard as he tried, could not get his plane to respond that Saturday morning, and he was on his way to his death. Some in the crowd said that they thought that it must have just been part of the performance. Others quickly realized that something had gone wrong. As he broke off, onlookers saw small puffs of smoke as they began to emanate from Farrier's jet. They did not realize that Johnny Farrier was using this smoke as signals to send communication to his colonel and commanding officer on the ground. Through his headset as it was heard, recorded, Johnny Ferrier heard his colonel say the words, eject, Johnny, eject. But to their dismay, the canopy of the plane remained intact over the cockpit. Again, it was reported that the commanding colonel radioed to Ferrier to eject, but this time he said, bail out, Johnny, bail out. Yet there was again no separation of craft and man. Captain Johnny Ferrier chose to stay with his plane. Ferrier's hometown newspaper, the Denver Post, reported that he had used the puffs of smoke to communicate his reason behind this to his commanding officer. It wasn't because Johnny Ferrier could not escape the plane. It was not because he could not get out, but it was because he would not get out. Therein lies the feature moment of Johnny Ferrier's life, the single description of all that he would ever be remembered for. Captain Johnny Ferrier willingly died on June 7, 1958, a little while after 9 a.m. outside of Dayton, Ohio, doing something that most would not do. It was not that he could not break free from his crashing saber jet on that morning. The eject button was functional. He could have hit the button and the cockpit would have released and the roof, the canopy of the plane would have came and separated from the craft. His seat would have ejected and a parachute was functional and attached to the back of his seat. The captain knew very well how to separate himself. From his spiraling plane, those below were unaware that he had options that were laying before him. It would 
only take a moment for Johnny Ferrier to set himself free. One small pull of a lever in the canopy would unhinge and his seat would release and the parachute would blossom and he could settle down and he could settle to the ground and his life would be saved. It was there for the taking. He could have easily escaped and pulled the escape hatch open and left the death trap that surrounded him. But the captain was looking at the houses below. The people who lived below knew nothing of what was happening high above them. They were just going through the motions of life. They were living lives both large and empty in homes made of wood and stone. Little did they know that above them there was a man that was making a decision that would affect them. He was in fact making a decision on their behalf. He had to choose. He had a choice to make, save himself, and they would all die below him or die himself, and they would all live. You see, Johnny Ferrier could have saved himself had he wanted to. It was not a matter of could not, but it was, in fact, a matter of would not. He could have left the plane unattended and watched the demise of those below. As he floated down to, gro to the ground in the comfort of his parachute, it is not that he could not. Some say that had Ferrier ejected that there could have been dozens and perhaps even over a hundred that would have died. Women and children, young people, older people, families, lineages, everything would have been stopped on that clear Saturday morning a little after 9 a.m. outside Dayton, Ohio. 1958 had that plane been left to its own trajectory and its own demise. People, whether they understood it or not, were at the mercy of a man above them. He was giving up his life for theirs. He had the power to execute a different outcome. He could. The question was not whether or not he could. The question was, would he? Could not meant that there was no other choice. Could not meant that he was bound by the thing that entrapped him. Hundreds could have died a fiery death had he held on to the throttle. He chose and he made his decision. He would not let them die. So instead, Johnny Ferrier gave up his life to save others. The most powerful people in the world are those who have power but choose not to exercise that power. The most powerful are those who, when they are presented with the choice, they choose not to give in to that which would most appease their flesh and that which would most appease their carnal desires. Those who walk in great authority in the world and indeed in the church and in their relationship with God understand that there's a bigger picture than just me. There's a bigger picture than just right here and right now. There's a larger picture that even extends beyond my children. We understand that Jesus Christ was the one who walked in more authority than any man that has ever lived, for he was more than just a man. He said to himself in Matthew, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Yet the chief priest looked at him and they began to mock him. The scribes began to make fun of him. The scribes and elders said, well, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. They had no idea just how wrong that they really were. If I could, I would let these words travel back and echo and in time and ring in their ears and I would want to tell them on this Sunday morning in Finley, Tennessee that Jesus Christ did not have to die on that cross on that morning. Jesus Christ did not have to lay down his life. Let those words echo in your ears, scribes and Pharisees. Let those words make an indelible imprint upon your mind. Jesus Christ did not have to go to the cross for you. He did not have to go to the cross for me. He did not have to die. He could have saved himself had he wanted to. He was the incarnate God. God became flesh and he came to earth through the womb of a woman. And at his birth they called him Emmanuel, which means God with us. He could have 
saved himself in his ministry. We would hear him speak words like, before Abraham, I am. He had the power innate. He had the power resident within himself to save himself upon speaking peace to the waves and the wind. In Mark 4, even his disciples were in awe at his power and at, at his authority. They looked and said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? He saved them that day and had he wanted to on the day that he went to Calvary, he could have saved himself. Twelve years with an issue of blood, a woman touched only the fringes of his robe and was healed. With just a touch, with just coming into contact with Jesus, what money could not buy and what doctors could not do, Jesus did. He, he didn't even realize, probably, he didn't even have a, he, he didn't even, under, he, he probably didn't see her coming up behind him, but all she had to do was touch the hem of his garment and he saved her because that's the kind of authority that was resident in Jesus Christ. That's the kind of power, that's the kind of man that he was, that's the kind of God that he is, and had he wanted to when he was on that cross that day, he he could have saved himself. With the sound of his mighty voice, both demons and angels stood at attention. He had the power to save himself. He had the power to come down, but he had set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he was looking beyond present pain. He was seeing beyond 39 stripes. He was looking beyond a crown of thorns, for the joy that was set before him, the word says, he endured the cross. He was looking ahead at your salvation. He was looking ahead at my babies. He was looking down, and he could have pulled the lever and hit the escape hatch had he wanted to. But he looked down, Brother Luke, and he saw you, and he said, you know, there's going to come a day when I'm going to show up in a revival, I'm going to fill him with the Holy Ghost. He looked down at your family and he said, I understand that there's going to be temptation and trial aplenty, but there's something inside of them that they don't see, but I see it from where I'm looking. They may not see it because they can't see around the corner, but I'm looking from up above, and I created them, and before they were shaped in their mother's womb, I knew them, and I ordained a future for them, and there's something inside of them. And so it's not that he could not come down, but when he looked and he saw your face and he saw my face, he said, I will not come down because I love them too much. When he hung there, they gave him vinegar mixed with gall. Gall is a numbing agent. They gave him that pain medication, that ancient pain medication. He, well, when he tasted thereof, the Bible said he would not drink. It was not that he could not drink, but it was that he would not drink. He refused their pain medication. He would not avoid the pain, his hands and his feet cried out for relief, crucified in the shadow of Golgotha, which is known as the place of the skull. They took a crown of thorns and they shoved it upon his skull. And without pain medication, he took the pain and that blood began to drip down. Why did he not take the easy way out? Why did he not take that numbing agent? Because he knew and he understood that for you and I to be delivered from our pain and for you and I to be delivered delivered from the things that, that, that mess with our minds, that he had to go to the cross. He had to do a complete work at Calvary. I don't know how you feel about it on a memorial day, but I'm glad that Jesus Christ laid down his life that I might have life. Amen. Not only did he lay it down that I might have life, but he laid it down that I might have abundant life. Amen. I preach in churches all the time. There are people that have been filled with the Holy Ghost. They have been baptized in Jesus' name. Their sins have been washed away, but yet they're still dealing with all kinds of issues and mess. They've been given life. They'll get to heaven. But I want to tell you that Jesus didn't come so that you might survive this life and barely limp into heaven, but he came that you might have abundant life. 
Hallelujah. Do you want that abundant life today? If you want that, why don't you just lift your hands and begin to tell Jesus, Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your sacrifice. Hallelujah. I, I have to admit today, I, I'm a little bit concerned with this entitlement time in which we're living. I'm a little bit concerned with even a younger generation coming of age and thinking that he had to die for us. Just because he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world doesn't mean that he had the op did not have the option to quit. He did not have to die for me. God had already destroyed most of Noah's world by way of flood. He could have done it again and started over. He had already repented that he had made men. He, the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were filled with the evil of man's heart and imaginations were running wild. God was even prepared to wipe out the lives of his own people had not Moses, the greatest intercessor that ever lived, stood between a sinful people and their God. And God looked upon Moses and had mercy because of his intercession. So before we believe that Jesus Christ owed us the cross, before that I believe that he owes me anything, that before I believe that he had no choice, I ought to remember that he didn't have to give me this abundant life. It wasn't that he could not come down from the cross, but it's that he would not. So crucified between two thieves up there for the crime of taking, Jesus Christ was crucified for the cause of giving. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Greater love hath no man than this that a man would lay down his life for his friends. So I'm compelled to ask you, I, I feel compelled of the Holy Ghost to ask us all a question today. He was willing to go to the cross for us. Are we willing to crucify our flesh for him? I understand what the world says, that my job, that gives me money, I earned that. That my money that I make is solely for my provision and for my enjoyment. And I understand the wisdom of the world that says that my children are for my joy and for my fulfillment and I can live my dreams through my kids. And I understand the wisdom of the world that says that if God has given us a ministry that it's for the purpose of impressing others and it's for the purpose of building ourselves up because in America we built that and in America we work our way up and we are the land of rugged individualism and independence and we pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and I understand the independent DNA that is in this nation but I, I, I fear in a generation on this Memorial Day that we have somehow forgotten that our founding fathers did not come to this land and search for gold but they came and searched for God and God is the one that led them to this land and God is the one that established this land. God is the one that established an environment that would be conducive for apostolic Pentecostal churches to spring up all over the countryside in the last hundred years. Why did God do that? Because he understood that for the gospel to be preached to every city and for the gospel to be preached for every soul and for the gospel to go to every nation, there had to be a place where men would lay down their lives. There had to be a place that he so I didn't build this this platform that I'm standing on here today but I'm here to tell you that because he would not come down from the cross he is the one that made a way when there seemed to be no way amen He's the only reason that we live. We, you and I, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but he became sacrifice that we might have life. He looked at us and he said, I will not come down from the cross. I love them too much. We've got to get a renewed understanding that our righteousness won't save us. 
He came down to my level when I couldn't get up to his. And I know I might be wearing a suit this morning, and I try to wear it the best I can, but I'm going to tell you what, I was a mess when Jesus found me. And when sinners come into this house and they see those who are looking right, and I think we ought to do our best on Sunday morning, and this church does a superb job of that, but we've got to have a spirit that says, you know what, I wasn't always this way, but Jesus met me where I was. He loved me the way I was, but he loved me too much to leave me that way. He came down to my level when I couldn't get up to his level. I need to remember that every good thing that I have, every perfect gift, did not come from my bank account. It did not come from my effort, but it came from a God that looked down and said, I will not come down. I'm going to sacrifice so that you might have a future and you might have life. So the money that I have that you have is not ours, but it's his. And he just allows us to keep enough to take care of us, and he blesses us. My children are not mine, but they're on loan for me to raise and to release in the kingdom of God. Oh, to God, if we could get a revelation of that. If we would raise up our children to send them and release them in the kingdom of God, send them locally, send them throughout the state of Tennessee, send them wherever the Holy Ghost will leave them. But could we get the revelation of Hannah's spirit that said, Lord, I know you just gave me Samuel for a season, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to be a good steward of the gift that you have given me, and I'm going to pour into them, and I'm going to try to open up some things inside of them that you placed inside of them, and you're giving me the word to open up that seed and it's going to begin to blossom inside of them. If you and I will get that kind of a mentality with our children, I want to tell you that Jesus will use your family to change the world. I need a revelation today that my independence is nothing in the shadow of his omnipotence. 23 years old, I was driving down a country road in Arkansas about four in the morning, headed to work, and I was thrown from my wife's convertible going 60 miles an hour. And I was living more for myself than I was for God, if you want to be transparent today. My destiny was in jeopardy. Oh, I went to church. I drove the Sunday school bus. I Felt like I had a call to ministry on my life, but really life was more about John than it was about Jesus. So I stand here on a memorial day at the mercy of a God who did not have to die for me, but he did it anyway. He didn't have to spare my life. A lineage could have been halted on that country road on that morning. But Jesus looked down and he saw something inside of me that I couldn't even see came to tell somebody today that just as Jesus Christ could have saved himself and abandoned you, you and I have a decision. We can keep our flesh alive or we can lay down our life for the cause of the gospel. And when he whispers a direction on our ear, we have a choice. We can either hit the escape hatch or we can obey. And we can allow the steps of good men and good ladies to be ordered by the Lord. You and I, can, we can live it up in the temporal or we can choose to we can choose to invest in the eternal you can i can the question is will i i can die daily i can crucify this old flesh every day in prayer i can the question is not can i but it's john will you get up on monday morning and crucify your flesh will i you can live a life of overcoming the question today is will you make that decision? Moses, I can just see him up there thinking. I can imagine Moses in his red saber jet. I can hit the escape hatch and I can float down to my golden parachute in Pharaoh's palace if I want to. I can live the life of an Egyptian. I've got the education. I've got the things. I, but Moses said, I can if I want, but I'm not going to. Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. 
for a season. I can imagine Joseph up there. Joseph, will you hit the escape hatch today, Joseph? Joseph, you can land in Potiphar's house. He doesn't even know what's in his house. It's, it, it's his, but it's really yours. You can even have his family if you want to, Joseph. I, I can, he must have been thinking, but I'm not going to. And because Joseph chose not to parachute down and enjoy the temporal, but Joseph chose to have an integrity to the eternal. He said, saved his brethren. He saved his family and the lineage of Jesus Christ came through his brother Judah because there was a man that said, I can, but I will not. Noah, are you going to land today? Those people think you're crazy. Build an ark. It's never even rained before. At that time, water came up to mist the crops and the ground from the ground. It, I can imagine Noah saying, you know, I've been preaching this, I've been building, and I've been doing, and I haven't seen any results. I could just set this plane down today, but I will choose rather to become the saved seed of all mankind. And because of that, Noah's family was saved. If I don't, who will today? Saul, you've been equipped in the darkness to become the apostle Paul in the light. Bail out, Saul. Bail out. I got the education to do it. I, I could be a leader among the Pharisees. Eject, Saul. Eject. I can't do it. Because my ministry is the hope of the Gentiles. And it's a blessing to the church. And if I bail out, what I'm doing is I've got half the New Testament inside of me. That's not going to flow through me, so I cannot come down. What's going to save lineages and the lost, loved ones, marriages, young people, and families? It's not a Sunday morning shout, but it's when God's people make up their mind that he gave his life for me, so I'm going to give my life for him. He didn't have to, but he did. You and I don't have to, but if we will lay down our lives here, others will join us there. I can't take my car to heaven. I can't take my house to heaven. This is a beautiful church building, but there's going to be a day you can't take this to heaven. I like that tie, brother can't take that tie to heaven. But you can take your babies to heaven. You can take your family to heaven. Take those girls to heaven. You can take your friends to heaven. And so if we could see in the spirit today, I could imagine that there's a decision that needs to be made in this house this morning. Perhaps you're the one that's in your red saber jet today. And you're faced at the crossroads and you have a decision. I could eject. I could take the easy way out. I could settle down and I could even probably settle for some things of God that are lesser than he intends for me to have. You can if you want to. But I'd ask somebody to make a decision this morning and Make up your mind that I will not come down. My dad told me a long time ago, he said, Son, the most important part of living for God is not repenting, though that's important. He said, It's not being baptized in Jesus' name. He said, The most important part of living for God is not even that time when the Lord comes and fills you with the Holy Ghost. He said, because I've seen people that have done all those things and had all of those experiences, and then they've chosen to walk away from God. He said, the most important part of living for God is having your mind made up as we stand today. wonder if there's somebody in this house who will make up your mind today. <clears throat> is the music comes to the platform. I, I'm going to open up the altar in just a moment. And when we open up the altar, 
I'm just going to make a request today. If you're physically able, if you have the ability to walk down here, I'm just going to ask you if you would do that today. I'm going to ask you if you would do that as a sign on this Memorial Day of commitment to God. Lord, I remember those who have laid down their lives for our country. Lord, I remember those who have laid down their lives for the gospel. Lord, not only to honor them, but one more time to recommit my life to you. I'm going to step out of the aisle and as a show to you. I'm going to let you know that I will lay down my life for you. That I'm going to invest in things that will not burn. That I'm going to invest in the eternal above the temporal. Amen. Would you just step out and come to the front right now? Amen. If you're able to do that, I thank you for that step of faith this morning. Amen. So I just kind of felt like we just need to have a time of consecration in the altar this morning. and Remembering his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, I wonder if you'll just lift your hands to him. I wonder if you'll just begin to lift your voice. Amen. We've got a lot of space up here in the front if you'd like to gather today. I wonder if there's a young person today that maybe has been dealing with some temptation. Maybe you've been dealing with a relationship that you know pastor wouldn't approve of or you know mom and dad wouldn't even approve of. I, I wonder if you're willing to lift your hands right now and give that to Jesus. Maybe you're on the job and there's some people on the job that are kind of pulling you a direction that you ought not go. Amen, men. Maybe it's something that you've allowed to inadvertently come into your mind when you weren't expecting. Why don't you just lift your hands and give that to Jesus right now? And all across this building, if you'll just lift your hands and lift your voice to Jesus. Amen. If, if there are some praying elders who will lift up your voice and begin to help us to pray right now. Lord, I'm praying for another generation that they won't come down. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, here at Finley United Pentecostal Church, God, that the sacrifice and the commitment and the faithfulness of these elders, Lord, I'm asking you that this determination, this resolve would be transferred to younger generations today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Elder, if you're there and there's a younger man beside you, why don't you reach over and pray with them today? Sister, if you're there and there's a young lady beside you, would you reach over and just, it, it just might be that your prayer might be what strengthens them today. I want to tell somebody if you're the first one in your family, if you're the only one in your family in the church, I just want to give you a word from the Lord today. You may be the only, but you're not only the only, you're just the first. There's others that are coming. If you'll make up your mind, I'm not coming down. Made up mind, a made up mind, a made up mind. That's what we need to leave here with this morning. A made up mind as for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. It's for me and my family, we're going to make decisions to follow you. Lord, I'm going to find a job in the church, and I'm going to put my hands to it and be faithful for you. Hallelujah. Oh, the Holy Ghost is in this house. If you'll just begin to entertain his presence today.